Welcome back to another week at Cheney Baptist Church. I'm Daniel and I'm joined with the senior pastor, Dr. Keith Peters. Uh, another announcement that we have, and we, of course, normally we play this videos, these videos during the announcements, so you don't always get to hear the announcements. Uh, but one announcement that we do want to talk about is the worship night that's coming up. Uh, it's going to be hosted here at the church. I think it's March 6th, but we'll try and get more information on that in case to try and validate it. Uh, but anyways, back to the actual discussion is over the past several weeks, we've been going over a series about parables, how God sees us, how God views us, and how he uses different analogies to show us his relationship to us, like the potter and the clay, uh, things like that. What are you going to talk about this week? Well, this week we're going to focus on one that's probably one of the more familiar uh, pictures that God uses, and that's that uh, he is our shepherd, Jesus is our great shepherd, and we are his sheep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, this is, uh, like I talked about earlier, these are different analogies where it shows us <clears throat> how we compare, though we are not actually sheep, right? We're humans, so we're distinct from sheep, but our relationship to God, is, or to Jesus specifically, is like a sheep's relationship to the shepherd. We are supposed to be following the shepherd. And we're not just, the shepherd, someone doesn't go around and say, you know what, I want to just watch sheep all day, right? Mm -hmm. They have a purpose for watching the sheep. The sheep serve a purpose. Their wool and things like that uh, is profitable for the shepherd. And I can imagine uh, how disappointed the shepherd would be if the sheep aren't producing wool, for example. Mm -hmm. In much the same way, not only are we supposed to follow Jesus, but we're also supposed to be producing something uh, for the benefit of why he is our shepherd. Yeah, one of these, uh, there are many, many par parallels. Of course, the 23rd Psalm is probably the best known Psalm in the Bible. The Lord is my shepherd, which implies we are his sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus in John chapter 10 said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. My sheep know me, they hear my voice, they follow me, but there's a thief out there, a false shepherd. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word pastor comes from a word, poiamen, which means to shepherd. Uh, so there's many, many par parallels between we as sheep. And this, this morning we're going to talk specifically about the problem with being sheep. Mm -hmm. Because many of, the, many of the situations that endanger or, or confuse sheep with the shepherd uh, we face as well. So we're going to focus on that. Years ago I read a book, uh, a, book uh, a Shepherd Looks at the 23rd Psalm. And uh, it, it brought to light a lot. Of, I'm not a shepherd. I've never owned sheep. I've owned goats before. Uh, but shepherds have, have acknowledged many of these parallels. And without understanding what a shepherd is, uh, or even the nature of a sheep, we miss much uh, of the significance of the parallels and the parables Jesus told concerning sheep. Yeah, and of course the other parallel we have to remember is how the shepherd relates to the sheep. We talked about earlier the sheep. A shepherd doesn't normally go out and find some random animal and be like, I'm going to watch you for a while, right? He has a purpose for choosing sheep. Uh, the sheep are supposed to be producing wool. But also there's this, this other relationship where the shepherd is there to protect the sheep. The shepherd is there to guide them to a pasture where they can have more food, right? Sheep by themselves, are, I've been told they're pretty dumb. They don't yeah. think very well. We will probably focus next week on the provision or why God gives us shepherd, the great shepherd, of course. And the word pastor literally means under shepherd. Peter talked about this in First Peter 5. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight, which means watch over them, mm -hmm. not by constraint or filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, not as being lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. And then when the chief shepherd shall appear, that's Jesus, the faithful under shepherds will receive a reward. It's interesting that the very next few verses talk about, but be, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is like a roaring lion. He's mm -hmm. seeking whom he may devour. So this morning we're going to focus on some of the problems that sheep have and, and I think hope to, to recognize we are prone to have the same kind of problems. Mm -hmm. For instance, you had mentioned wool uh, and one of the reasons for sheep or shepherd investing the time and, and effort and energy into caring for a flock is the, is the wool. Well, one of the dangers is if the sheep isn't sheared regularly, the wool will end up making him bloated, mm -hmm. uh, over, overweight. Mm -hmm. And if a sheep falls down and he's bloated, 
uh, he can't get up by himself. It's called a cast sheep. Sheep have four stomachs. Many people aren't aware of that. And if the, if the sheep gets on its back and can't get up, uh, and one of the reasons they might not is because the, the wool gets tangled or the wool is too heavy, the sheep gets bloated and the gases in the stomach start to rise and he swells. And he will die in that condition uh, if, if he remains there for probably more than a day. Uh, so even the, the reality is God created us, even the picture of sheep, uh, to produce something. Mm -hmm. And a sheep that won't produce anything is pretty, pretty useless to the shepherd. Yeah, so using that analogy, being used by the shepherd for the wool is a mutual benefit. It benefits the shepherd, in this case Jesus. Serving Jesus would benefit Jesus in the sense that we're serving him, but it would also benefit us. Uh, because that's what we were made for. We were made to serve him, uh, and when we don't serve him, it's like the bloated sheep. Right? Yeah. Another picture of this uh, that's got nothing to do with sheep is that there's two huge lakes called seas, large enough to be called seas in Israel. The Sea of Galilee, which receives water from Mount Hermon, uh, and then uh, the Jordan River feeds into the Sea of Galilee, creates the Sea of Galilee, and then the Jordan River flows down from the Sea of Galilee throughout Israel, the major source of fresh water, and then into the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. But the Dead Sea has no outlets, so it's very rich in mineral deposits, but it cannot sustain life. Yeah. And there's a, an analogy there when we receive all the blessings of God, but we don't have a, we don't give, we mm -hmm. don't serve, we don't uh, share, then we may have a lot of knowledge, become bloated with pride because of all that we know, but we can't sustain life. And Jesus said, another par parallel, I've chosen you to produce fruit, mm -hmm. not just to have big trees. Well, an interesting uh, story, I think it was by David Platt in his book, Radical or something like that. He talked about mm -hmm. there was this guy and kind of using money as the wool, for example. Uh, if we get too much money, we want to keep it, but it ends up becoming self-destructive, right? So many celebrities and all these millionaires and billionaires they, they will admit it never satisfies. They, they're less satisfied now than they were before. Uh, but this guy, he had started a company and he was somewhat wealthy and he decided to spend a year trying to survive off of just kind of the essentials, figure out how much would it cost for him to live a normal life. And at that time it was like $20,000. So I said, okay, $20,000 I can live off that. God, anything you give me above that I'm going to give away. And he became like a millionaire, but he still lived off of $20,000 and gave the rest away. And it's just kind of this idea, uh, if you view the wool as a blessing, uh, the blessings that God gives us, sometimes God gives us more than we need because he wants us to be sheared, if you will, and that additional to be used somewhere else. Uh, and some people use the, uh, the idea of America being so wealthy because it's helping send out missionaries around the world and helping uh, financial needs around the world and things like that. Because America despite how people want to view America as this really bad place, uh, financially speaking at least, we are the most generous country in the world by individuals, not just our government sending out monies, but individuals sending money to other countries uh, to help them in their time of need. Uh, but one other thing that I want to talk about is this idea of sheep. Uh, in po political sense, I'm not trying to make it political, uh, but in a political sense, we've, we've heard a lot about sheep these days, sheep people. Uh, this idea of people who are just following the government without asking questions. And usually we look down on that as being dumb, right? Because we think of sheep as being dumb, just follow, follow the shepherd wherever he leads. Uh, but then we think of Christianity as following <laughs> Jesus wherever he leads, and we see that as admirable. But I think the reason why we view them differently is because the Bible says it's better to put trust in God than to put confidence in man because compared to God, we are dumb, right? <laughs> Our knowledge is finite. His is infinite. Uh, what he knows is far above what we know, so we can follow him trusting that he knows what's best for us, whereas when people are blindly following the scientists or the government, things like that, uh, not to say that the government scientists are always wrong, but just this idea that they are limited in their knowledge as well. So when we view people following after them, we see it as uh, something that shouldn't be blindly followed, but something that should be double-checked. Whereas with God, we view it as someone who already knows everything. 
uh, we can trust him and things like that. Absolutely, and that is one of the problems with being a sheep. We have no sheep have no natural defense. They don't have sharp teeth. They really can't tear anything. Their hoofs aren't that hard. They're low to the ground. Uh, so, in the nature of sheep, God has put in the nature of sheep the inherent knowledge uh, that they're vulnerable. So they're going to follow someone because they're going to expect someone to take care of them. The, the benefit of that is sheep make good followers. The mm -hmm. disadvantage is they don't always follow the right one. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about division in the context of a church. And even Paul said in, in uh, Acts chapter 20, he called the different pastors of the different churches in the book of or in the city of Ephesus together and, and said take heed over the flock which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers you're shepherding mm -hmm. you're you're responsible for those people uh, because uh, and take heed to yourself feed the flock of God which he's purchased with his own blood because I know that after my departure grievous wolves will enter the sheep in other words sheep are gonna be deceived uh, wolves in sheep clothing is how Jesus described it in the Sermon on the Mount. But they said, but also of yourselves shall men arise seeking to draw disciples after them. Uh, so sheep can be misled by false prophets, Shepherds, yeah. false pastors, and simply by prideful people who are convinced that their way is right. And, and the word division in the Greek word, Greek language is schism. Uh, just make people having to make a choice. And we do that every election cycle because there's different people campaigning for different positions. Um, but the, the tendency is we're not discerning about the people we choose to follow. Mm -hmm. And that's why the Bible says in uh, Hebrews chapter 13, you know, obey them which have the rule over you. Uh, but whose faith follow, but consider, consider the end of their conversation. Where, it, where are they wanting to take you? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, the, the context of uh, wolves, wolves in sheep's clothing imply that there, there's an element of deception there. We've seen this many, many times in history where politicians make false promises to gain people. The tragedy is sometimes they tell us exactly what they want to do, and it's horrible, but we do it anyway. Uh, so that's one of the problems of sheep is we're gullible. Mm -hmm. We are easily led and easily misled. Yeah, I was talking to, I, I'd made many videos in the past. Uh, one particular video was about homosexuality, and somebody had commented recently talking about how uh, I was really looking forward to seeing someone on YouTube uh, talking about homosexuality in its biblical context, and you failed. <laughs> like, thanks. Uh, but he, his, his point was that uh, I didn't agree with him on his idea of homosexuality in the Bible, therefore I must be wrong. He says, look up the context, dude, or something like that. So then I go back and I said, even if there was not a single verse in the Bible that said homosexuality is a sin, which there are verses, but even if there wasn't a single verse in the Bible that talked about that, I could still conclude that it's a sin. And he didn't ask why I gave him the answer because I didn't. We haven't had the back and forth yet. But the reason for it is because whenever God talks about marriage, it's always between a heterosexual couple. Never once does God mention homosexual marriage as being legitimate. He made laws. He talked about laws and laws and laws about marriage. But never once did he talk about homosexual marriage. No one in the Bible is ever recorded to be married in a homosexual marriage. So then the Bible does not seem to hold homosexual marriage as legitimate. Uh, at least if you were to claim that they, it does, you'd have no evidence to support that. You just have to say, well, maybe it does, and it just never mentioned it. Uh, so if homosexuality is not viewed as legitimate in God's eyes, then it would be considered fornication to pursue homosexual practice because anything outside of marriage is considered fornication and therefore homosexuality even if the Bible never mentioned it as sin would still be understood as sin because it's having sexual relations outside of marriage uh, since the Bible does not seem to refer to it as a legitimate marriage and, so, and even then the Bible provides a plethora of passages and him saying that I was wrong for my, how I interpreted it 
I went back to like five or six verses. For example, Sodom and Gomorrah. Why do, of course, we would say that they were punished for the, the sexual immorality that was going on in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. But then most homosexual advocates would say, no, they were punished for their lack of hospitality. Uh, it's a very common argument. But then in Jude, it literally says they were punished for their sexual immorality. And the only sexual immorality that we're ever talk, told about uh, in the story of Genesis would be the, the, the men pursuing the male messengers that God had sent. Uh, that's the only thing recorded in that story. So when Jude is referencing sexual immorality, the only thing that his audience would have understood was from that story. Well, that, what your point is very important, uh, and it's also one of the problems of sheep because we are so easily misled. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 4 says, I, you know, God, I bring people in the church in leadership positions to equip the church for the work of the ministry so that we're no longer like children tossed about by every wind of doctrine, every opinion, and by and slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lay in wait to deceive. Uh, Paul warned Timothy in, in uh, first to, Second Timothy chapter 4, preach the word, mm -hmm. not your opinions, not your preferences, preach the word, because the time will come where they will not endure good food, sound mm -hmm. doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Now we're mixing our metaphors, but the, the idea of doctrine is that's what the shepherd is supposed to feed, mm -hmm. that God's people is sheep. Uh, and, but Paul warned Timothy, stay with the truth because there's going to come a time where people won't want good, healthy teaching. They're going to they're gonna want preachers who are going to give them ice cream for every meal or mm -hmm. sweets or something that's going to satisfy yeah. their appetites instead of what, what their souls need. Yeah. And, and so many people have seen that. They've, yeah. they've rejected sound Bible teachers and replaced them with people who tell nice stories and make people feel yeah. good about themselves. And that's why I brought it up was this idea that this person has been hearing maybe sermons, maybe they go to a church, and it's become very popular for even certain denominations to just become completely accepting of homosexuality, claiming it's, no long, it's not a sin at all, it's claiming that God doesn't consider it a sin. And we look at that and say, that's based on your opinion, that's based on your biasness, but the Bible does not support that. And then I, I, I even remember I had to read textbooks about how the homosexual movement has tried to misconstrue misconstrue the Bible to try and say what it wants it to say. For example, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's not that they were, it's not because of their sexual immorality, it was because they were not nice to the messengers that God sent. Uh, things like that, or whatever it might be, they're, they're always trying to find a different reason. Well, in that passage in Acts 20, when Paul is describing the responsibility of leaders feeding the church of God, taking the oversight, he said, but of your, of your own selves, that would be preachers, men will arise speaking perverse things. Uh, and the word perverse in the Bible means twisted. It, it means they, they, they twist God's truth to satisfy the appetites, either their appetites for power, or prestige, or the appetites of the people they're trying to influence. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the quickness, basically what I'm saying is that with, as we are sheep, right? We're not very smart. I mean, not compared to God, but it's better to follow after what God has said rather than follow after what another sheep has said. Absolutely. So when trust what God's word says rather than what this pastor who is contradicting God's word is saying. So if God says homosexuality is wrong, then we may say, you know, God, I don't agree with that, but you're God, right? Yeah. Uh, so let me follow what you say. Uh, rather than what another sheep says, things like that. So hopefully that makes sense. And that goes back to the verse you said, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in men.
there are no words, Lord, that moves our hearts than those words. Our complete and total faith in you and what you did on the cross is so essential to our eternal salvation. It's all about you, and it's always been about you from the beginning of time. And God's plan to take you to the cross to die for the sins that we've, we not only our past sins, our present sins, but our future sins were all paid for. The wages of sin was death. And, and Christ dying on the cross, Lord, I just praise you and thank you for what a plan, because without that, there would be no hope in this entire group, no hope at all. So we thank you, praise you for what you've done for us. We love you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, in your name. Amen. The children can be dismissed for Children's Church. Join me in the 23rd Psalm. Continuing the theme that we've been on as far as ways in which God sees us. Why is this important? Well, because our perception, what we think of things, or our perspective, how we respond to things, is, is affected by how we see things. Our perception can be poisoned by deception. Satan is the god of this world, and he blinds minds so that we believe lies. And lies that we believe have great power over us. Uh, by the way, I, and I was reminded by Jeanette that in the bulletin, Wednesday it was put down as show night. It's actually snow night, kids. So you can come dressed for a snowball fight because we're going to give you one one way or another. But we can all understand, I think, that if we believe a lie, it, it motivates the way we behave. Uh, in counseling, I, I often early on give people a, a picture of cycle of needs. And as children, we all have needs. We have physical needs. We don't have any problem understanding that. We have emotional needs. That gets a little trickier. We have relational needs, trickier still. And if our needs were not met, if we weren't fed, right, if we weren't cared for, protected, we understand the physical consequences of that to a baby, to a child. The same is true emotionally. If we're not affirmed, if we don't feel by the people in our lives that we have any value, we'll grow up tainted by that perception. And sometimes that perception, often that perception is wrong. In other words, if, if you were raised by parents that feel, felt that way, then they're going to have trouble, if they weren't affirmed, if they weren't valued, then they're going to have trouble understanding and, and they're forgiving that. Many of you knew I grew up without a father. He left us when I was quite young. Uh, so I didn't really have any experience relating to men as a boy growing up. And, and so much of what I've learned, I've learned the hard way uh, when it comes to responding or fathering particularly and fathering boys. That's why God gave me six to practice on. And I'm down to Michael and I'm still not doing a very good job of it. <laughs> But understand that it, if we believe it, it motivates us. We respond to what we believe. But what if what we believe is a lie? It's not true. Then we have to do what the Bible says, repent, which literally means think differently. Satan blinds our minds. That's why it's important for us, and that's why I'm spending so much time in this year particularly, or the first part of this year, helping us to refocus how God sees us. Not how we see each other explicitly or intentionally, but if we understand how God sees us, then we'll, we'll be able to rethink our value and our purpose and God's plan and perhaps see one another with a clear vision. The Bible reveals lots of different truths and pictures in, or, in order to do this. In fact, the ver verses right after the God of this world blinds our minds says, but God who commanded the light, the truth, to shine in our hearts to give us the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So the first picture God gives is one of a treasure, the first one I shared in Matthew 13. The kingdom of heaven is like a man that found a treasure buried in a field, and he went out and bought the field so he can have possession of the treasure. The second parable we shared picture is in the very next verse. Kingdom of heaven like a man, merchant man seeking goodly, valuable pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, extraordinary value, he went sacrificed, sold everything he had so he could buy that pearl. Then a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that God describes us also as clay, pliable, 
in the hands of a master potter. Behold, as the clay in Jeremiah 18 is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand. Isaiah 64, Lord, thou art our father, we're the clay, you're the potter. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, by grace we're saved through faith, not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast, for we are his workmanship, poia men, we are his masterpiece. Last couple of weeks we focused on a beautiful picture that God often repeats that he sees us as his bride, currently engaged to Christ and in heaven we'll see it more perfectly. This morning I want to talk to you about another very familiar passage or uh, passage and principle that God describes us as sheep. Psalm 103, the Lord he is God, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, they follow me. First Peter chapter 5, Peter writing to the church leaders, feed the flock of God which is among you, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. Matthew chapter 9, 36, Jesus saw multitudes and he described them as sheep without a shepherd and therefore they were vulnerable. And of course the most famous passage using this picture is the 23rd Psalm. Read it with me if you will, if you have and you're comfortable. I know we may have different translations, but you're welcome to read it out loud or even whisper it to yourself. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or lack. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I'm going to take a couple of weeks to unpack this because there's so much to unpack. But this morning, I'm going to focus on how the picture of sheep, describing us as sheep, is really describing the many problems that we have. Now, I've never owned sheep. I've been to sheep folds. I, I've talked, I've read, I've studied. I own goats at, for a period of time and miserable creatures, no offense intended if you're, but, uh, but many of the principles are the same. For instance, sheep are prone to wander and so are we. Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. You see, sheep, like goats, are indiscriminate eaters. They will eat anything, almost anything, that you, that's in front of them. And that means if they see something over here that looks better than what's right here, they'll move in that direction. And they will literally, without, without malice, without evil intent, they will follow their appetites and find themselves separated from the flock. Paul talked about this in Philippians 3 and verse 18. He said, uh, many walk, which I've told you before and tell you now even weeping, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because their God is their belly. They seem to be motivated by satisfying their temporary appetites. Their glory is their shame. And it says why? Because their mind, their focus, the floneho, they regard or value earthly, temporary things. So when, when following the, the Lord, and he says, this is the way I want you to walk, and we see something over there that looks better, if our focus, our value is on temporary things, we're going to find ourselves following our appetites, our bellies, using this analogy, and drifting away from the Savior. This is why Jesus told that story about, I'm the good shepherd. And he used the example of the shepherd who realizes one of the sheep have gone astray, and he can't find his way back. So he says, when he had found it, he puts the 99 safe in the fold. He goes out and searches for the sheep. When he finds it, he lays it on his shoulder, rejoicing, saying, rejoice with me. I found my sheep, which was lost. So we're, we like those sheep. Hey, let me, since you came to the shepherd, how many of you could say there have been seasons in your life where you wandered away from him? I can say that. Aren't you glad he didn't give up on you? Aren't you glad in a multitude of ways he found you. We're also not only prone to wander, we're prone to poison. As I said, sheep are indiscriminate eaters. And they have, dif they have trouble differentiating between what's good for them and what's bad for them, healthy and unhealthy plants. The shepherd of a flock, when he's 
prepares a table. That phrase, he prepares a table before me. He actually goes to the pastures before the sheep, identifies poisonous plants, and he uproots them. And if they're too big, like a bush, to uproot, he will hedge around it to try to keep the sheep because he knows sheep will eat whatever they can get a hold of. Psalm 23, 5, this is what this actually means. Thou preparest a table before me. John 10, 4, I am the good shepherd. Uh, the good shepherd go puts forth his sheep, but he always goes before them. Why before them? Because he's looking out, because he knows they're going to eat whatever's on the way, and he's trying to identify things that might poison them. And then his sheep follow them, for he know, they know his voice. That's why God challenges pastors. And by the way, the word pastor means shepherd. Poiamen in the Greek language, it's the word shepherd. That's why God challenges pastors to preach the word. Give, give the people that God has brought under your leadership, give them a healthy diet of the word of God. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. What's that about? That's about when they start wandering away, care enough about them to try to encourage them to come back. For the time will come, remember they follow their appetites, the time will come, by the way, it is here, the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, healthy food, spiritually nourishing truths. But after their own lust, can we say their God is their belly in Philippians? After their own lust, what they want, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned to fables. Sheep are indiscriminate eaters. Our churches today, there's over 350,000 churches in America. I'm not qualified to gauge what's being taught in every pulpit. And I do not begrudge large churches, but I know many large churches are large because they're serving meals that appeal to the general population. Exhort, reprove, rebuke, nobody likes that. Nobody likes to be reminded of our failures and that we're moving the wrong direction or that we're following our appetites. Not only are we prone to wander and prone to poison, we're prone to predators. And by this, I mean we're vulnerable. There's a lot of things out there that can harm sheep. And this I know for a fact. Sheep have no natural way to defend themselves. Have you, I don't know that there's fainting sheep, but I remember when I started learning about goats many years ago, I, I had a, a friend I talked to. They're called fainting goats. And their natural defense is when they get excited, the muscles in their neck swell, if I remember correctly, pinch the, the blood supply to the brain, they pass out. <laughs> that's not a very effective way to protect yourself. But that story reminds me, sheep have no way. They have no teeth to speak of. Their hoofs are not that hard, and they're pretty low to the ground. They may kick you in the knee. They have, the rams have horns. Sheep don't have horns. So sheep are incredibly vulnerable. And in fact, their only source of security is the shepherd. Thou preparest is an interesting word in the Hebrew of the Old Testament. It's arach. It means you order, you arrange, you furnish, and you even battle. You don't only, only remove the, the, the plants that are going to harm us. You remove or defend us from the people or the things that are going to harm us. You prepare that table where? In the presence of mine enemies. David learned this lesson personally. Remember the story he told when he faced Goliath and had to talk King Saul into authorizing him? He said there was a lion that grabbed a, a, a lamb, and, and I killed the lion. There was a bear that came after the sheep, and I killed the bear. Nowhere in there is that the lamb wrestled the lion and destroyed the lion, or, or the bear. was. David had to step in, and that's one of the reasons why he was called a man after God's own heart. 1 Peter chapter 5 is a general epistle Peter is writing, and in chapter 5, he's writing to pastors or elders, leaders of the church. To the elders which are among you, I exhort whom also an elder, feed the flock of God. He's talking to pastors. Feed the flock of God which is among you. Taking the oversight, you are responsible. The word oversight, uh, episkopos, is the word that's translated, in, the root word is translated bishop in other places of Scripture. You need to look over the flock. You need to watch out for where they're going and what danger they're in, not by constraint because you have to, but willingly. 
Neither is being lords over God's heritage. You know better. You know more valuable to God than they are. You just have a different responsibility. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, who is that? Jesus. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you'll receive a crown of glory. Then it goes on to say, Sub submit yourselves one to another. God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Be sober, which means be, not just don't be drunk. It means be aware. Be watchful. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Who? What animals in a flock, sheep or goats or water buffalo, what animals does the, do the lions go after? Generally, they go after the stragglers, the weak, the vulnerable. That's why Satan not only attacks from outside of the flock, the Bible warns us he actually seeks to infiltrate the flock. Remember? And the purpose is to divide us from the shepherd. Beware of false prophets. You know, Jesus said right after this, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Look at what I done, I've done. And Jesus said, I will profess to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So the context of false prophets is people who the sheep think are shepherds who have their best interests in mind but are poisoning them. And in particular in that context, telling them there's another way to go to heaven other than a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So right, after they, right before he talks about that, he says, beware false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Their nature has not been changed. They may look on, on the outside like God's people or like sheep, but on the inside they're actually dangerous. Now there, here's the point. Does every, remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Who has put these tares in the wheat or in, in the field? An enemy has done this. Now I want to be real careful how I say this. Jude talks about certain men. I, I, I wanted to write of you concerning the common salvation, but it was necessary to, that I write and, and urge you to earnestly contend for the faith. Why? Because certain men have crept in unawares. They're, they're dangerous men. They're false prophets. They're going to spread dissension. I often thought that that was just evil men, satanic plants, and that's dangerous enough. But what is more dangerous in a flock? A wolf that knows he's a wolf and has fangs or a wolf who thinks he's a sheep? Beware of false prophets. Sheep are followers. We're, we're prone to, to destruction. We're prone to predators, but we're also prone to division. Sheep are natural followers. They're not naturally leaders. They're natural followers. So Satan infiltrates the flock in order to produce one way or another bitterness or rebellion that causes the sheep or individual sheep to get further and further away from the protection of the shepherd. First Samuel 15, 23 says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. Who was this written about? Anybody know? King Saul, the first king of Israel. God gave him an assignment. He did almost all of it, but he, for very specific reasons, he didn't fulfill it all. And he said, look at all I've done for God. And God looked at the one thing that he knowingly and willingly disobeyed. And he called it, he called a spade a spade. He said, rebellion. Hath the Lord his great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? As to obey the voice of the Lord, rebellion is a sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is iniquity and idolatry. Rebellion is when we choose to, we know what God wants, but we don't want what God wants. So we do what we want. That's following our appetites. The heart of that is witchcraft. And the word rebellion is the Hebrew word meri, rebellion. It comes from the word mara, which means bitterness. So rebellion and bitterness are often tied together. Why? And then stubbornness. What stubbornness? What is stubbornness? When does stubbornness come out? When you're confronted with what you did wrong and then you dig in. The theme song is I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I mean, I'm, this is, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> this is who I'm going to stay. That's stubbornness. Rebellion often comes because things didn't go our way. Somebody didn't value us the way we thought they should value us. Somebody didn't agree with us. And that bitterness grows in our heart, that Mara, and then it begins to produce an attitude that says, I no longer will follow you. I won't respect you. I won't submit to you. And that's where rebellion comes out. And rebellion is a sin of witchcraft. And bitterness is infectious. Looking diligently, lest any man fail the grace of God. Remember, grace 
Uh, charis means God's influence on our heart that enables us to understand what he wants and gives us the, the ability, the willingness. It's God that works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. God's spirit says, this is the way, walk ye in it. And we say, no, I want that way. Lest anyone fail the grace of God. We don't respond to it. And a root of bitterness spring up, trouble you, and many be defiled. Now, in the context, whether it's a church family, a family family, a group of friends, someone in there has a falling out with someone else in that flock. And instead of resolving it, they get angry, and they get bitter, and they get stubborn. So that root of bitterness, God says forgive. God says talk about your issues. God says seek reconciliation. But we won't, and we don't. So a root of bitterness grows up. What does that mean? Thereby many be defiled. The word there is me, I know. Isn't that an interesting Greek word? Me, I know. What I want, I know. You, I don't know. You don't care. Me, my way, I know. And it literally means contaminated. I get bitter. I get my head around other people, get them to take my side. And what have I just done? I've just infected other people. Now, in the context of a, of a flock or a family, it divides. How does he do this? Well, two primary ways, there are many other ways, but two primary ways in the context of a, a, a sheepfold or a flock, a church. He does this through false shepherds. Acts chapter 20, Paul gathers the leaders of the church of Ephesus together and warns them, take heed to yourselves, Keep up with your own relationship with God because there's a lot riding on it. If you're not following the chief shepherd, you're misleading everybody else. Take heed to yourself and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. I don't want to get sidetracked on this, but overseers is the Greek word uh, for bishop, episkopos. It means lead them. Feed, poimeno, shepherd, the church of God, which he, God, has purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. How many of you have ever seen an old werewolf movie? How do werewolves make werewolves? They bite them. That's the picture here. There's going to be wolves in sheep's clothing or wolves acting as shepherds and you're going to get close enough to them that they're going to, they're going to come among you and you're not going to deal with them. You're not going to recognize them. Therefore, also of your own selves, these are pastors, you're going to get infected by the wolves, by the werewolves. Shall men arise speaking perverse things, distrefo, distorted, corrupted things. You begin to rethink the scriptures according to your own appetites. Just like sheep like to follow their own appetites, shepherds, if they forget that there's following a shepherd and they decide, I'm in charge here, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go where I want to go. Men shall arise speaking perverse things. Why? To draw away disciples, sheep after them. Folks, I cannot emphasize this enough. That's why we all need to know the Word of God. Matthew twenty two twenty nine. 29, Jesus said, You do err not knowing the Scriptures of the power of God. Err means you're drifting away. Acts 17, 11, Paul was taught in Thessalonica. The Jews rejected him, followed him to Lystra where they tried to have him killed. Then he goes to Berea. And it says this about the people of Berea. I'm sorry, they were more noble than the people in Thessalonica. There was something different about them. What was different? They searched the scriptures to, to verify that the things that Paul was saying was in fact God's word. Second Timothy 2.15, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed can rightly divide the word of truth. If I'm a preacher and there's not one person in this church that actively, why do you think I give you notes? that not actively searches, and they, they say, oh, I didn't like that. That's fine. If I, if, if I say everything you like, I'm not doing my job. But instead of reacting to what you don't like, why don't you look at the scripture I have next to that point? Because your real problem isn't with me. I was saved three days, 1973, during a Wednesday night service, which was in a home, 
the youth pastor said, we're going to go to the local nursing home and we're going to sing and minister. I said, I'm in. I didn't know any Christian songs, but I liked music. And, and he looked at me, and you may not appreciate this, you may not like this, but he looked at me. This is in the 70s, you know, hippie season. He looked at me and said, well, Keith, you are welcome to come, but if you're going to come and represent the church, you need to look like a man. What happened to Keith's little chest? <sighs> what do you mean I need to look like a man? Well, like a lot of kids at that age, I had long hair. He didn't argue with me. He said, I just want you to go home and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. No one had ever given me a scriptural reason why men should look like men. I went home, I read it. I was three days old in the Lord. I didn't like what I read. I went to my older brother who was a Christian, with also long hair, by the way. What do you do about this first? You know what he said? Jesus had long hair. How do you know? Because all the pictures say he had long hair. I wrestled for three days. I wrestled. I think one of the reasons I have so little hair left is because I was so proud of my hair. <laughs> and I'm, what I'm saying is a preacher said something, but he just didn't say because. He said, just read this scripture and you pray about it and you do what you think God. I got my hair cut. Here's my point. Had I rebelled when I was confronted with truth that I didn't like, had I rebelled in 1973, that would have become the pattern of my life when I got confronted with things I didn't like. In Hebrews 13, 7, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow. Remember, Paul said some are going to draw sheep after them. But notice, God doesn't say follow the leader. He says consider. Consider the end of their conversation. Where are they going? Who are they following? Folks, I'm going to say this, and, and I, I believe fundamentally God brings people to church. Satan can too, by the way. And sometimes people bring people to church. They're in a vulnerable season of their life. But you're supposed to follow someone. There should be a pastor in your life. It may not be me. But you better make sure whoever you say this is going to be my pastor, that you know where he's going. That you can have some level of confidence that he is submitting to the best of his ability to his shepherd. Otherwise, you're going to fight. find yourselves following a man who's rationalized in the scripture, who appeals to your appetites, or worse, his appetites, and begins to get you to rethink what the Bible clearly says because it's inconvenient. Matthew 7, 15, Jesus talked about false shepherds. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the messengers of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. It shouldn't surprise you if his servants be transformed as ministers. But false shepherds, they are a problem. But they're not the only thing that causes division in, in the church. False sheep, tares, wolves in sheep clothing, or simply they may be genuine sheep, but they're still following their appetites. And when the shepherd doesn't lead them in the direction they want to go, they're going to rebel. Romans 16, brethren, mark, scopeo, look out, watch for, consider them which cause divisions. The word literally means they're trying to create an environment where there's no longer unity. And offenses, scandalon. What does scandalon sound like? Scandal. Has anyone ever come to you bad-mouthing someone else in the church or, or the pastor? Trying to, produce, trying to produce a what? A scandal. The word offense is a scandal. It's literally a trap stick. You know what a trap stick is, right? It's a stick that holds up a trap with some kind of bait on it. And when the animal crawls under there and starts chewing at the bait, it does what to the stick? Falls in the trap. God says there are people in the churches that are going to cause divisions because they're, and they're going to trap you. So know the doctrine you've learned. Know what God says and avoid them. That's the word shun. Eclino. It says, why, why would God say watch out for rebels? Watch, watch out for rebels. Why would God say avoid them? 
Have you ever been around a discontented person? Have you ever been around someone who just didn't like what was going on at work or the decision that was made in the church? Have you ever been around? And every time you're around those people, it may be at work, it may be in church, it may be at a family reunion, every time you're around them, where's the conversation end up going? About what's wrong. And you know what happens more often than not is we don't want to be impolite, so we follow the conversation for a while. We may not know what's wrong. We may not believe it's wrong, but we spend enough time with those people. What's it going to do to our own perspective? It's going to poison it. Now all of a sudden we're watching. Wow, I never thought about that. You know, maybe they're right. And we get infected. For they, that's these people that do this, they don't serve the Lord Jesus Christ, but they, there's that belly. They're serving their own appetite. They're following their own ideas. And by good words and fair speeches... They deceive the hearts of the simple. The word simple doesn't mean ignorant. It means innocent. Innocent. Proverbs 13, 10, a whisperer separated the chief friends. Proverbs 22, 10 also has the same concept. So false followers. Remember, rebellion, which means they don't want to follow the shepherd, is like the sin of witchcraft. Remember Korah. If you don't know this story, you need to read your Bible. Jesus mentions, uh, Jude mentions this in, in Jude about people who crept in unaware. He gave Korah as an example. Number 16, the children of Israel were on their way. It was only, they were about a year at Mount Sinai. I think if I remember the passage correctly, there's only 15 or 20 days between Sinai and Kadesh Barnea, the promised land. So they get to Kadesh Barnea. God says, this is the place, go in. And they didn't. They said, No. We won't follow the leader. So all of a sudden they said 12 men in. 10 of the 12 said, this is the way we need to go. Two of the men, Joshua and Caleb, said, no, let's obey God. So what do we have in the, the flock of Israel? We have division. So all of the nation of Israel had to decide which way they're going to follow. Guess which way they went. We're going to follow these people. And then God, Moses came to God and God said, tell them to turn around. They don't want to go in the promised land, fine. They can go back into the wilderness. But know that everyone that's over 40 years old is going to die in the wilderness. So they spent the next 40 years of, don't miss this. Right after this, they said, let us make us a leader that will take us back to, to Egypt. Well, they had a leader, didn't they? What was his name? Moses. Was Moses going back to Egypt? So there were, there's division. So God says, okay, they can go back. But this is what's going to happen. So picture yourself, you're 41 years old. You were part of that crowd that voted this way. But you're in the middle of the desert. That crowd decided, oh, we, we made a mistake. We're going in the promised land, and they lost. People died. Moses said, don't go. God's not with you. You crossed the line. So now that's the attitude of the people of Israel. It was their choice. God gave them what they would. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. God gave them what they wanted. The Bible says he gave them uh, the lust of their heart, but sent leanness in their soul. Now, that's chapter maybe 13, 14. Chapter 16 comes along. Now here's a man named Korah. He's a Levite. And he, he challenges Moses' leadership. But notice how he does it. First of all, he finds two friends, Dathan and Abiram. Korah gets his head together and starts complaining about Moses' leadership. Who, by the way, made the choice to go back in the wilderness? Not Moses. Notice what they did. Don't miss this. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram started navigating, and what's that word? Recruiting. Recruiting. There's, there's a... Uh, networking. Thank you. That's the word. They started networking. Men who were leaders in the congregation, important men, men who probably were struggling with the decision, the consequences of their own sin, so they were ripe for discontent and rebellion. So they poisoned 250 others. And then they all gathered together, again, 253. Did Moses know what was going on up to this point? Did Korah come and talk to no, Mo, Moses? No. Before he talked to Moses, he needed to get a little army behind him. A little bit more influence, but what had just happened? Now there's 253 leaders who are confronting one man, God's shepherd. Then God says, okay, he publicly tested them. Have these 250 men make censers, put incense in them, and offer them to the Lord, and the Lord will show you who he's going to accept. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 18 and 19. I don't think, I don't know if I'm going to finish this message, but this is a very important principle because this is how churches are destroyed. This is how people are hurt. God says, I hear that there are divisions among you. The next verse said, the next part, there must be heresies. When we think of heresies, what do we think of? We think of false doctrine, dangerous doctrine. But you know what's more dangerous sometimes than doctrinal differences? is personality differences. If those differences are not accepted and respected, they become sources of rebellion. There must be heresies. Paul said, if there's division, there's disunion. There's, there's Satan working to pull the flock apart. Why? That they which are approved might be manifest. What does manifest mean? Revealed. What does approved mean? Except, but whose acceptance should we be seeking? Whose acceptance are we prone to be seeking? The people around us? The word approved literally means current under a sale, where there's a problem and you're being tested. And so God tested these men, and then God judged them. He didn't accept the offerings of the 250 men. In fact, he, he killed them. And then the three men that started, this is the interesting thing, the three men that started it weren't even there. They didn't show up. They were still back in their tents. And the Bible says, God said, through Moses, tell the people to get away from these tents. And Mo, God said, through Moses, if these people die a natural death, know that God has not sent me. But if God do something new, and the earth opened up and swallowed them. That's exactly what happened. The earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses, that would be Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, and all the men that are pertained to Korah and all their goods. You'd think that would solve the problem, right? God clearly revealed. He dealt with the, he dealt with the infection, the 253 men who were rebellious. You with me so far? Look what happened the next day. On the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron. Notice what they said. You have killed the people of the Lord. You see what's really going on in God's people in the Old Testament? That resentment that they're all, every, please understand, everyone in this congregation that was over 40 years old had just heard a death sentence from God. You're never going to get to the promised land. So they, were they happy about that? Were they unhappy about that? Did that mean God had rejected them? Did that mean they couldn't live reasonably happy lives even in the context of the desert because God still fed and watered them every day, right? Man in the morning, quail at night. They had their flocks. But that's not what they wanted. What did they want? Well, really, they didn't want the promised land because of the battles necessary. So what did they really want? Let us make a leader to take, take us back to Egypt. God says, you're not going back to Egypt. Egypt belongs to the devil. I delivered you from Egypt. So now they're upset. They clear, Moses didn't take a shovel and dig those tents up. God did all of this, and yet the infection had spread. Because there were, in this case, it's false followers and false leaders, because these 250 men were influential men. So what did God do? God sent a plague and killed 14,700 people. Now, how many of you are enjoying this message? Okay, don't flatter me, it's not that good. <laughs> Why am I telling you this? These are chapters I don't like to talk about because they reveal an aspect of God that we don't like, and that's justice and holiness. I'm telling you this because what happened in the Old Testament, God uses in the New Testament to say what happens in churches. Korahs and people like Korahs come in, they gain influence, they rebel against the leadership of the church or against God's leadership, they poison people, they divide people, and it was so severe that God, that it, started with, it started with who? One man. One man became what? Three men. Three men became 253 men. God says, I got to stop this. God miraculously kills 253 men. But before they died, what did they do? 
cross infected. Now the next morning, everyone, the whole congregation is angry at Moses. So God killed 14,700. What do we sing a picture of? Don't miss this. You may never be back, but this is an important lesson. We're seeing God operate on cancer. We're seeing a cancer that could have been resolved between Korah and Moses and God, but it wasn't. He went to his friends, infected them, or COVID will be relevant. He kisses on his friends. They get infected. They go and start smooching with 250 other men. They get infected. There's a showdown. God, forgives expression, isolates them. But before they get isolated, what have they managed to do? Infect others and it got so bad let's say the surgery uh, the uh, the uh, cancer is in my leg do they have cancer in the leg i don't know cancer is in an organ but what happens if you don't deal with that cancer quickly what happens it metastasizes it does what gets in other organs if you ignore it it has it can have a way of getting throughout the whole body so if I got cancer in uh, two livers, we got two livers or two kidneys? One liver, two kidneys. I have cancer of the kidney. I don't want to lose my kidney. I like my kidney. But the doctor says, man, it's got to go. I don't want the surgery. I ignore it. Now a year later, it's metastasized in another kidney or in a liver or somewhere else. That's what we're seeing. And eventually, God killing these 14,700 is th the kidney's got to go or you're going to have to be put on dialysis or whatever. You got the picture? It's an infection. Who started the infection? Who? Don't miss this. Who? Not Korah. Satan. He whispered, this isn't fair. In fact, Korah came to Moses publicly in this 250. You take too much on you. And Moses recognized really what was going on. Okay, I didn't ask for this job. I didn't want this job. But it's you who are taking too much on you. James chapter 3. <laughs> James chapter 3 talks about the power of the tongue. Talks about if any man doesn't offend with their mouth, they're perfect. You know any perfect men? And the whole context is the tongue is a world of iniquity. He says, uh, here with blessed we God, and there with cursed we men, with the same tongue. Uh, we can behold how great, a, uh, be, behold the ships, that though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they can be changed with a little rudder. Behold the horses can be changed with a little bit. He said the tongue causes us to change and others to change direction. And then he says, how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. And it's set on fire the course of nature, and it is set on the fire of hell. James is telling us the truth of what happened is someone used their tongue to spread discontent. So we're prone. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. I hate to stop when I'm not done because this isn't a good place to stop. Let me, let me just say this. We're prone to panic. That's what happened in Korah's story. It started with one, then two, then 250, then 14,700. What do we have going on here? We have herd mentality. We're easily influenced. I learned many years ago at a pastor's conference. I was a relatively young pastor. And there was an older pastor. He got all the pastors, and we were camping. And I remember sitting around the campfire. He said, you know, you, talking about this principle of people, and what is, what is a leader really? There's positional leadership, right? They're the boss. Who has more influence? A detached boss uh, over you, a detached boss or CEO you don't know, or the man that you work with, the manager, or even a lead technician. So leadership isn't position necessarily. There are lots of leaders in this church. I'm the pastor, but there are lots of leaders. And some of them don't have any position, but they have influence. So we are influenced. And that pastor said, watch out for the dams. I said, what's a dam? He says, a female sheep that's had a lot of kids. It's because many times when the shepherd starts moving, the young lambs will look to who? 
grandma or mom. And if she goes, they'll follow. But what if grandma decides, I'm not going there. I'm going here. What will happen to the ewes and the young lambs? Will they follow the shepherd? Will they follow mom or grandma? He said, that, he said the dominant dams are the ladies in the church that have a great deal of influence. I'll just leave that there. Back away and no one gets hurt. <laughs> Sheep are easily spooked. And they'll tend to react with a herd or a crowd mentality, producing sometimes a stampede effect where others get caught up, confused, and trampled. You hear something like this. When, when somebody of influence leaves the church, unless they're very mature, what have they done before they leave the church? Have they come to the pastor or the leaders of the church and talked about their problems usually? Who do they talk about their problems with? Friends. Friends. So when, the, when the, a person of influence leaves, it puts everyone, all their friends, at a what's wrong. And even if they find out what's wrong, who do they find it out from? The person who's leaving. And they have one side of a story, and they're influenced by that side, so they start to leave. And then what other people start seeing? What in the world is wrong? All of those good people leaving the church, there must be a problem. There may be a problem, but most of the time, the problem wasn't resolved God's way. It was resolved Korah's way. That's the herd mentality. Remember Korah? Remember Jesus. Palm Sunday. Hosanna. Hosanna. Good Friday. Crucify. Crucify. Why? Mob mentality. Most church problems can be easily resolved, just like family problems, if we follow God's directions. I want to challenge you. We're going to stop. I'm not done. We have more problems. <laughs> I want you to stop. I want you to take the notes home. I want you to look at the scriptures. And I want you to ask God, God, do I have any of these problems? Do I have any of these problems? And then I want you to read Matthew 18. By way of conclusion, I'm going to give you a clue, but I want you to read it. How many of you will say, Pastor, I will read Matthew 18 this week? Come on. I want to see it. Look around. Hold each other accountable next time. Did you read Matthew 18? Let me tell you what it says. Jesus talks about it's, 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 the offenses are going to come. There's going to be disagreements. There's going to be problems. You're not going to agree with everybody. Then he shares the parable of the lost sheep. What does lost sheep and offenses have in common? Because offenses cause people to begin to drift. Then he gives directions, clear directions on what do you do when you have an offense? What do you do when someone hurts your feelings? And maybe the pastor, maybe ladies in the kitchen, maybe in the nursery, maybe in Sunday school class, maybe in the pew. It is inevitable, Jesus said, but the offenses will come. You will not always agree with people. What do you do? And Jesus gives very clear directions about this. I want you to focus on them. And then, he, and then Peter says, well, how often do I have to do that? Seven times? Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. And the, the do that is forgive. You may not be able to reconcile your differences. I've, made this, I've never made a decision in this church by myself, any decision that would affect the church. I have deacons that the church is elected to help me process. But there are times where not all the deacons are on the same page. We're not always, even good men, good women are not always going to agree. But when a decision is made, we're moving in this direction. Well, even in the deacons, not everyone's going to agree. But if they're godly men and the church and the deacons and the pastor has prayed and we've asked God, we go in this direction. Well, what if one of them doesn't? Or the church votes on a matter. And the church says, this is what we want to do. But the people who voted no didn't get their way. What do they do if they're reasonably mature people? Well, didn't go my way. But this is where God called me and these are my friends. We can disagree. What if they do if they're not spiritually mature or they don't follow God's directions? They can get angry. They can get bitter and they can start the Korah. Jesus warns when he, he, and he tells the story of the unforgiving servant. And we'll stop there. And we'll pick up there next week. Let's pray together. 
Father, I thank you. <laughs> it's an insulting picture. But Lord, it's a painfully accurate one. Your word tells us repeatedly, describes us as the sheep of your pasture. You put people in our lives. You bring people to this church. That's what the word church means. It called out people. And you put leaders in the church, myself included, imperfect leaders, flawed human beings. Or oh, there are people in this congregation who are more qualified, perhaps by education or experience, to be leaders. It, but you called me here. And you raise up other men to hold positions of leadership like deacon. And you, you have, we have women and men in this church because of their nature, their personality, have great influence. The truth is, Lord, everyone leads somebody. Help us to recognize the problems that are an inevitable part of being human and being sheep. Help us to recognize that we are prone to wander and to realize that our appetites, the more we feed them, the more power they have over us. We're prone to poison, Lord. We can be poisoned by lies. Our opinions of someone can be poisoned because of the opinions of others without the benefit of all of the truth. And we can prejudge based on hearsay and be poisoned in our relationships. We're prone to predators, Satan and wolves in sheep's clothing. We're prone to division and we're prone to panic. Lord, all of these problems can be resolved if we just come to the shepherd. Stay close to you. We ask that you would help each of us as we commit to read your prescription in Matthew 18 for offenses. Right in the middle of that, Lord, you use the picture of the sheep. Help us, Lord, to value our relationship with you, with one another. Help us to recognize the dangers of wandering away from the people God has placed in our lives to challenge us and to help us to grow. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.